All right, cool. So uh, my name is John Lamberton, and I'm here with Scott Rayo. Scott Rayo, for coffee people, really needs no introduction. Uh, he's a consultant, a writer, blogger. He has at least three books now. Uh, three, four? Uh, four, fifth is coming out in a week. Yeah. Awesome, cool. Um, yeah. yeah, you've been in coffee all over the world. Um, it really, uh, I consider you my coffee guru, so uh, I <laughs> thought this would be an exciting opportunity to just ask you some questions, uh, shoot the shit with you. Uh, I'm not trying to extract information from you necessarily, but just get uh, a, you know, opportunity to talk through some stuff. So, um, good. Uh, so most people know you for being a coffee person, but you've been quoted saying that you are more fanatical about tea. Uh, yeah. so what does that look like uh, in practice? Well, uh, historically, I used to drink a lot more tea than coffee. Uh, which is nice because tea is a little more sustainable. Like, you know, you can sleep a little better on tea and perhaps think a little more clearly on tea rather than too much coffee. Um, unfortunately, in years past, my stomach doesn't like tea as much as it used to. So I have to, I have to curtail my tea, my tea drinking or else it kind of bothers my stomach. And I have to make sure I, you know, keep it modest, put food in my stomach first, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, so mostly these days, I just, I'm very, I cherry pick my tea drinking. Like I'll drink it's like super fresh teas in the spring and, and some oolongs later and some vacuum, vacuum sealed teas, you know, at various times of year, but I won't, uh, I won't just drink tea as a, as a regular random thing. Like I'll just, you know, I'll just wait until there's something that's kind of irresistible because there's, you know, there's always like a little bit of like my stomach feels a little, um, irritated by tea. So, um, I'm just try to try to focus on amazing teas and just accept that those are, those are the only ones I get to drink once in a while. You know? Mm -hmm. Uh, I find that my stomach is bothered particularly by green tea. Do you, is that similar for you or is it uh, any tea in particular? You know, it's, it's definitely green tea, but it's also if, if the tea gets at all astringent, my stomach really doesn't like that. And I, I think a lot of people with mild, you know, stomach irritation problems, uh, things that are astringent tend to be a little bit inflammatory for the stomach. Because um, astringent compounds uh, take your mucous membranes and they tighten them up. And so, you know, that's what you get that, that puckery feeling in your, in your mouth. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that that same feeling in your stomach is probably a source of irritation. I'm just speculating. I see. Interesting. Yeah. Cool. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm more familiar with your experimentation in coffee, but uh, can you run me through some of like what you've, like some of the geekery and tea? <laughs> sure, sure. Um, I think one thing that never gets discussed in tea, and this was kind of the state of coffee when I started writing about coffee as well, is um, how to brew it. Because obviously it's very simple to brew tea. You just, you just drop leaves in hot water and you wait a little while and it's done. Mm -hmm. But quantifying that process is something that I've actually never seen anybody do in print. So mm -hmm. for me, I've calculated things like, you know, what's the right time, temperature, ratio combination for various teas but also figured out things like if you double the amount of leaves or else it's water, you actually cut your steeping time by four, like, you know, basically by, by a quarter, you know? So mm. I, I should say like, if it takes a minute to brew X amount of leaves and water, it takes 15 seconds to brew two X leaves and the same amount of water. Um, so one of those things, you know, when you see instructions that are like, Oh, steep this tea for three minutes. And then they tell you nothing about weight to weight ratio. It, it's a nonsense number because you can't know the time without knowing the ratio and the totally. So things like that, you know, uh, just the same, it's the same approach that we all take to coffee in terms of, you know, we, we care about time, we care about fineness of grind, we care about that combination, how they affect each other. And with tea, uh, people aren't really thinking of ratio, leaf size and time as a, as a threesome that have to be considered together. Interesting. So uh, in terms of tools, besides like a scale, uh, your palate, a timer, potentially a refractometer. Uh, how are you like going about quantifying this? Uh, I mean, of course, the thermometer is important as well. Oh, gotcha. Um, of course. Refractometers, like the ones we use for coffee, don't work so well for tea because mm -hmm. the range of total dissolved solids or strength in tea is is really quite low. Right. So I, I have a special refractometer that's pretty sensitive that will give me some data for tea, but most of us that have typical bricks meters or coffee refractometers, the the numbers are too low in the scale to really be useful. Interesting. Um, so is that refractometer like just recalibrated? Is it like similar to the VST one or is it uh, like, it's, what's that process it's, like? Uh, it was made by VST. Well, it was, it was licensed by VST and it was a, a more, uh, it had more decimal places than most uh, refractometers do. 
So, so it's going down to much lower refractive indexes and lower TDS uh, readings. Interesting. I assume that extra granularity wouldn't offer any, I mean, that wouldn't really be helpful for coffee, right? Wouldn't be very useful, no. Gotcha, okay. Yeah. Cool, um, so in terms of teas, uh, like I was thinking back to this uh, tasting I was at with uh, Peter from Song, and mm -hmm. he had all these interesting teas, and I was just curious, if you were to curate like a, a tasting for somebody like me, uh, what would that, like what would a selection look like? Um, you know, it depends on a couple of things. If you just said, uh, pick the teas you like, unfortunately for you, all of the teas I love are Japanese. Um, but if you said pick a range, like, let's say that maybe should make up the cafe's menu, we might be talking about some Japanese green, some Chinese green and white and oolong and black, and maybe one Indian tea. Um, I think one of the things that most tea drinkers don't focus on is things like how fresh was the tea and is, is it, uh, like an early spring, pl spring pluck? Is it a late spring pluck? Um, the quality of leaves in early spring is it's the flavor is more delicate. The leaves are more delicate. It's it's um, there's more there's more buds that create um, that delicate flavor, and then you get like uh, bolder leaves and bolder flavors later in the in the harvest. Um, so really, you know, you can't just say like, oh, I'm just gonna drink this green tea. It's like, you know, is it all buds? Is it two leaves in a bud? Is it one leaf one bud? Is it you know, all leaves and, and, you know, what quality level is it? Even if it's called something like Dragonwell, which is quite famous, I mean, there's probably a thousand iterations of quality within the Dragonwell spectrum. And mm -hmm. so, you know, unlike, I shouldn't say unlike coffee, but coffee's got a little more transparency now as far as the wording that's on the bag and, and how it teaches you a bit about quality. Um, with tea, it's very difficult. Sometimes it just says Dragonwell. And for all you know, that could be $1,000 a pound or it could be $5 a pound. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, they they don't really they really haven't done a very good job in tea of communicating quality on on the bag or or such um, in a way that you know like in coffee you could walk up to someone and say this coffee is an eighty seven and you know what an eighty seven should cost in tea although the tea buyers do have that communication with each other there isn't that communication with consumers. Gotcha. Um, so a, a lot of my regulars when they ask me about coffee they'll sort of have this question of like. Well, I don't want to know, you know, about the general thing. I want to know what you're drinking, and I feel the same. Like if in this curation thought experiment, I'm just wondering what you would uh, drink and you know suggest for somebody. I mean, uh, not suggest 90%, for somebody, but right. Ninety percent of what I drink is early season Japanese green teas, mostly sencha, a little bit of gyokuro, um, and then I drink a little bit of oolongs throughout the year. I don't drink much else. I've never liked pour. Um, I don't drink many black teas, um, you know, here and there I'll drink like an all bud black tea, like some of those Yunnan bud ones that are just really lovely and soft. Um, but yeah, for me, it's, it's, I don't know what it is. I, I think it's, I think it has to do with my body, my health, my biology, that there came a time where I used to drink quite a wide array of teas. And then suddenly my body just kept giving me the signal to go back to the Japanese green teas. And the mm -hmm. Japanese green teas have a lot of chlorophyll. Um, gotcha. I don't know, you know, I know that they have a different amino acid spectrum than most teas. I don't know what other factors there may be, but something in that Japanese green tea, my body is telling me like, that's the one I want. That's the one I want. Um, and so I just kind of listen to that. I mean, I still enjoy the flavor of other teas, but I have like almost a, almost like a visceral craving for the Japanese teas I don't have for anything else. Huh. So it's part flavor, part sort of like pharmaco pharmacological disposition, I guess. I think so. I think so. I mean, I think that's an underrated thing. I mean, we've probably talked about this, but, you know, there are these famous studies where they put rats into a room and they track what foods the rats choose. So it's like, imagine like a rat buffet, right? Mm -hmm. And you send the rat into the room and you track what he eats. And then what they do is they swap the microbiome amongst the rats. They, they give like rat A, rat B's microbiome and vice versa. They send them back into the room. And what they find is that by and large, rat A eats the food that rat B used to eat and rat B eats the food rat A used to eat. And what they're saying basically is that your microbiome is telling you what to eat, right? Gotcha. So on some level, my microbiome is probably telling me, drink these steamed green Japanese teas. It has something that we want, you know? So Makes sense. it could be something else, but that's, that's my guess. So. I think that's a good explanation. Mm -hmm. uh, so you mentioned amino acids and, uh, that makes me think back to that same tasting uh, with Peter. And I remember this moment where maybe about the third cup, I look over at like a fellow taster and we both had this kind of like, you know, crazed look of like, this is something like special. This is beyond coffee. Like, 
and we describe it as tea drunk. And uh, is there anything be besides theanine that you could attribute to that sort of like tea specific uh, caffeination experience? You know, I, I try not to think of isolated chemicals and give them credit for things the way people do. I think, I think that that um, reductionist thinking is oftentimes misses the bigger picture. I, mm -hmm. I don't know what it is. I, I, I really, um, you know, I don't think, for instance, it's just caffeine or just theanine or, or any other just this. I think there's, there's a whole system at work of hundreds and hundreds of compounds. So I don't want to make an assumption that I have any idea what's going on. Um, what, was, what was the tea that Peter gave you that you like so much? Um, I think there was, I'm pretty sure there was a dragon well. I don't recall the particular teas, but uh, I think it was just like having, you know, an assortment of nice teas uh, after being somebody that drinks coffee all day and being like, this is, yeah. this is very pleasant. So um, about 10 years ago, I was driving cross country and I stopped in Des Moines, Iowa. And there was this new tea place that had very serious teas. It was kind of a surprising find for Des Moines. And it was, I guess it was late March, early April. I guess it was early April. And the guy said to me, ah, you know, we just air freighted in some fresh crop dragon well. It was literally harvested three days ago in China. And I was, I was all over that. I'm like, okay, yes. <laughs> like, I'm tasting this. I'm buying this. I tasted it. And it was easily the most glorious tea I ever tasted. And that, that started me out on my understanding. I think that this happened to everybody in coffee between you know, 10 and 20 years ago, depending on your awareness and where you were in the industry, one day you realize, wait a minute, I love coffee when the green is fresh. And, and once, you, once you start realizing that, you can't go back to six or 12 month old green because it just doesn't quite have that same thing that you want. And this tea blew me away how good it was. It wasn't just high grade Dragon Well, it was high grade Dragon Well with like that little je ne sais quoi that you can only get from something that's super fresh. And Ever since then, I've been I've been hunting. Like at this time of year, I'll I'll go crazy. Uh, normally, uh, in the spring, I go to Prague at some point, and, and there's a tea bar there that the guy specializes in Japanese teas, and he's got like fifty or a hundred competition grade Japanese teas at any given moment in time. And uh, you know, I'll walk in once a year, and he'll be like, "Hey, Scott," and you know, he totally remembers me, and he'll just lay out like a tasting of twenty Japanese teas for me, and I'll just wait until that moment to buy all my teas for the next few months because. I know he has extraordinary teas and I know that he's going to let me taste like 20 of them. And mm. uh, it's awesome. But it's just, you know, this year, obviously because of COVID, I won't be doing that, but uh, that's always a treat. Mm -hmm. um, now, am I just oblivious to the, the, you know, awesome tea scene in the U S or is there not really an awesome tea scene? It's pretty isolated. I feel like in every city there's one or two places and there's a handful of people who care, but we've, we've never got the kind of traction with tea that we got with coffee. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think we're, we're not a tea country We're we're, you know, people who live off of coffee and, and expect the aggressive high rather than the subtle uh, sustained high that tea gives you. And uh, I don't know if that's ever going to change, you know, that's fair. Uh, yeah, cool. So, American, you know, I'm sorry. I said it's not very American, you know, tea is, uh, <laughs> yeah. it's too subtle for us. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Good description. Uh, so, uh, you started a podcast a while ago that you only did two episodes of, and in the second one, I think you were hinting at a discussion of coffee and the gut microbiome, and um, I personally was super stoked to hear that, and um, <laughs> if you would feel comfortable talking about what you were thinking about with that, I'd, I'd love to hear about it. Sure, sure. Yeah, I'm not much of a podcaster. I realized it just wasn't for me, so I, I gave up. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so. Going back to those rats in that room with the buffet, mm -hmm. our microbiome is, is managing our health in many ways that have only really become apparent through research in the last 10 or 15 years. And a lot of people poo-poo it, but the only people who poo-poo it are people who haven't read the research. If you've read the research, you are completely sold that the microbiome is doing so many things behind the scenes that we had no idea. And you know, doctors are a little bit oblivious to this. I mean, you know, let, let's face it, the medical industry completely didn't notice the microbiome until about 10 years ago, which is mm -hmm. kind of ridiculous given that there is almost no disease that the microbiome doesn't play a part in. Um, they manage your immune system, they tell you what to eat, they control inflammation, they control immune responses. It's like, you know, the microbiome is just dominant in terms of managing what's going on inside your body. So that said, what you eat affects your microbiome and what your microbiome is affects what you want to eat. And coffee, tea, and wine, 
and other extremely high polyphenol rich foods and beverages. They, they are what are considered um, bacterial modulators. Mm -hmm. And what this means is that your cup of coffee has some toxic chemicals like caffeine and the, the, what is it, theobromine mm -hmm. um, and other alkaloids that are, that are deadly to microbes. And your coffee also has polyphenols that are awesome for microbes, sort of like fibers, like just feeds the good guys. And what's going on is that when you drink coffee, you're, you're selectively killing and selectively growing various microbes. And generally speaking, we consider coffee healthy because coffee by and large is on balance killing bad guys and growing good guys. Mm. Okay. So that's almost the definition of, of what's healthy to eat is, you know, what's affecting your microbiome in a positive way versus a negative way. Right. If you eat bread and, and rice and sweets and whatever, like you're generally not helping your microbiome whatsoever. If you eat broccoli and sunchokes and coffee and tea and wine, you're generally boosting your microbiome's health, right. And diversity. Mm -hmm. So those things are considered healthy. So the key thing with coffee is that all these studies keep coming out showing that people who drink three or four or five cups of coffee a day live longer than any other demographic group. Okay, so if you drink one cup, you don't live as long as people who drink four cups. And if you drink no coffee, you don't live as long as any either of those other two groups. All right, so what's going on there? Why is coffee making you live longer? So pretty much every chronic disease just about responds relatively positively to coffee with the exception of some people who have certain conditions that don't mix well with coffee, for instance. Um, but, you know, I think that what's going on is that bacterial modulation, if you do it on a habitual basis, so basically every day, you are benefiting your microbiome and you're benefiting your health. Now, if you're an occasional coffee drinker, you probably won't get any benefit. And if you're someone who goes on a little bit of a coffee fast once in a while, I want you to think about it like this. If you drink coffee 11 months a year and you take, coffee, you take off of coffee for one month a year, you're kind of committing bacterial genocide during that one month. Okay, it's a little bit like if you decided to just stop eating fiber for a month or if you just decided to fast mm -hmm. for a while, you're devastating your microbiome temporarily. And then it takes a while to grow it back. So the best thing you could possibly do for your health, strangely enough, in, in my mind, I'm not a health expert, I'm just, this is like my own speculative theory, is pick what's sustainable for you and do it consistently. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you like coffee and tea, find how much you want to drink on a daily basis and stick to that. Don't just say like, oh, I'm just going to stop eating coffee for a month because it's bad for me or something like that. Cause that's, that's going to be bad for you. Whereas if you just have coffee every day, it's relatively good for you. So I'm not saying you have to force feed yourself coffee or tea. I'm just saying, find the healthy things that you enjoy that appeal to you and just stick with them. And don't, don't change too much because that change destabilizes your microbiome. Now uh, hearing this, seems a little bit dangerous for me because I've, I've recently been contemplating like easing a little bit back from coffee just to like try to resensitize myself to it and get better sleep and stuff. But uh, you're telling me to drink coffee every day <laughs> in volume, right? Well, I mean, look, I'm not saying, I'm not saying never change how much you drink. I mean, if you think you've been drinking too much, I mean, you work in a coffee bar. So mm -hmm. it's an occupational hazard that it's, it's very likely that sometimes you drink more than you mean to. Um, but if you can get yourself in the range of drinking two, three, four cups a day, and and still sleep well then staying consistent is also going to help your sleep because if you drink two cups every day and then one day you drink four cups it's going to mess up your sleep right and if you drink four cups every day and then one day you drink two cups you're going to drag all day so if you just say what's my magic number is it two cups three cups four cups and if you try to do that relatively consistently that's probably good for your microbiome and it's probably good for your daily cycle of of alertness and sleep and and all that kind of thing gotcha now, uh, thinking back to that podcast, if I recall correctly, there might have been like a regional element to it and sort of like a parallel roast element, like maybe like, you know, these places roast darker and have this kind of dietary preference. Um, mm. Is there something to that? There, there is. It's, this is all very speculative. There's not really very good research on this. I would say there, there was a bunch of research going on for a little while. I don't know what happened because it seemed to go quiet, where they were comparing light roast and dark roast and trying to figure out which had the more beneficial polyphenol profile. Now, unfortunately, most of the people doing the research were people who had a product sell. Mm -hmm. And so I think their research was always kind of like, if they found something that didn't jive with their product's marketing, they just never published it. And if they found little snippets of research that helped their product, then they released it. And I think so we were getting kind of a, um, 
a distorted sense of the truth. Um, I think that light roast coffees and dark roast coffees, the, the quantity of polyphenols in the two is probably not very different. It's probably slightly higher in lighter roasts. I would say that the, the big health risk with dark roasts is that if oils get exposed on the surface of beans, you are going to turn those oil rancid in two days, three days, four days. I mean, I'm very sensitive to rancidity. So if coffee set oil on the surface for two days, I definitely sense rancidity in the coffee. Um, gotcha. So it's got to be there. So I would say that um, generally speaking, denser coffees that are grown at higher altitudes have more nutrition. They have more polyphenols. Lighter roasts tend to have slightly more polyphenols and lighter roasts have no risk of rancidity. So it's reasonable to say that if you had to make a choice, you would drink high grown, lightly roast coffees, which is what you and I and other people who have been in coffee a long time tend to prefer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, what's really interesting is going back to those rats in the microbiome, you get habituated to certain foods and that makes you like them. Like there's mm -hmm. all these studies showing that you can convince a baby to like broccoli if you feed it one spoonful of broccoli every day for three weeks, right? And the theory is that the microbiome is adapting to the broccoli and then asking for the broccoli from now on. Now, if you're a dark roast drinker, you're probably not going to have your first cup of light roast Kenya and say, aha, I've seen light. Because your microbiome has adapted to darker roasts and the polyphenol spectrum in that dark roast. So your microbiome probably prefers darker roasts. So you probably have to drink light roast for something like the three weeks that the baby needs to eat broccoli in order to get that adaptation where now you are firmly in the light roast preferential camp. Interesting. Okay. That's my, again, this is very speculative. This is all based on little snippets of research, some of which mm -hmm. are a little bit um, questionable because there was commercial interest behind them. Gotcha. Okay. Cool. Um, well, thanks for that. Um, we can dive into coffee more generally now. Uh, <laughs> So uh, you've been in coffee for over 20 years, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, is it like 30 now or? Hey, I'm not oh. that old. Um, <laughs> I would say 27 years, yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, can you give us a sort of like uh, perspectival montage of that career? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, in the beginning, I got into coffee shops, but not coffee because the, the I went to UCLA. And on campus, there's a coffee house called Kirk Coffee. It's just a really lovely place with these stained glass windows. And it used to be that people used to smoke there and there were poetry readings. It was that kind of place. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't like my living situation too much my second year of college. So I spent all my time at the coffee house. Now, the coffee was pretty much all hazelnut or even if it didn't say hazelnut, it tasted like hazelnut, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And it was disgusting. The coffee was horrific. <laughs> um, but that was, that was the state of coffee at the time. Then down the street, this company opened called City Bean, and one of the owner's names was James, and James and I became good friends, and James was the roaster, and he was really dedicated to making great coffee, and to me, he was probably the best roaster in the country at the time. Um, Is this James Marcotte? Yes. Yes. So, little known fact about James, who's now a, a salesman for, for Intelli until recently. Um, mm -hmm. James, James is really a kick-ass coffee roaster for a long time. Um, so James got me into good coffee, and that was one of the few places you can go, and you can get like a high-quality, single-origin, well-made cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they would do batch brew of, of coffees that were like 87 points, which was unheard of at the time, right? And they weren't overly darkly roasted. I mean, they were dropped halfway between first crack and second crack, you know? Um, then, you know, so during that time period, this is, this is like the uh, early 90s, what you had was you had Starbucks and you had flavored coffees. And then you had a few places in the entire country, there were just a handful of places that were a little bit like what James was doing. There was, there was a place called Buchanan's in Boulder. There was, um, oh gosh. Um, there was a place in, in New Haven, Connecticut called Willoughby's. There was Coffee Connection in Boston and Cambridge, um, which was George Howell's old company. So what you really had was in, in places with good universities, you had one quality focused coffee shop Right. We had one at UCLA, they had one at Boulder, they had one at New Haven, they had one in Cambridge, right? And, and there was, of course, Pete's in San Francisco and Berkeley, which was too dark, but, but quality-oriented for our argument's sake, right? Mm -hmm. So this went on for a long time where Starbucks was kind of dominant, and then that, that better than second wave, but not quite third wave company kind of grew over the next 20 years. 
And then the third wave kind of hit its stride somewhere around 10 to 15 years ago. And then you had people like Jeff Watts and uh, Peter, I can't believe I'm, I'm forgetting Peter's um, uh, last name. I feel terrible. Something uh, Ono, Gugliano? No, he's, no. He's, he's, yeah, yeah, Giuliano. He used to, Giuliano. Um, yeah, he used to uh, work for Counterculture um, and he worked for Panic in San Diego. And, you know, guys like him were uh, going to origin and actually buying direct and actually helping farmers and dry millers figure out how to do a better job. Um, so there was this cross pollination of ideas because of these guys who were kind of pioneers who were just traveling the world, tasting coffees, talking to farmers, producers, of various kinds, talking to dry millers saying, hey, I saw this practice over here. We could apply this here, teaching people to cup at origin. I mean, this, this is quite a revolutionary idea that this cross-pollination was happening. And now you've got, you know, the market segmented into crap coffee, Starbucks, and third wave, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, that, was, that was an evolution that took you know, 25 years, basically, from the time of companies like City Bean to the time of companies like Go Get Em Tiger or GMB now. Um, and, you know, I watched this transition. I mean, you know, when I opened my first shop in 1994, I didn't roast a second crack, but I wasn't a light first crack roaster. I was somewhere in between. And so was George Howell. He may not remember, but George used to tell me that I should roast just until almost before second crack. And, and you know, he was probably one of the best two or three roasters in the country back then. Um, and you know, every, every few years, myself, him, other people would get a little bit lighter because there was a little bit of give and take between us and the customers where we wanted to go lighter. Customers always want darker, as you know, and it just took time to win their trust to then be able to introduce them to slightly lighter coffee. So there was this evolution to lighter, lighter, lighter. That evolution probably went too far with some companies five, 10 years ago where they were going very light, but they weren't good enough at roasting to go that light. Mm -hmm. Like you don't want to go so light that you underdevelop. You want to go as light as you can with decent developments. And that takes a fair amount of skill. Mm -hmm. And as, as a group, we've collectively figured out how to go lighter and lighter, um, you know, with, with good development. Um, but anyway, that's, that's like one perspective on, on the evolution of coffee over the last 25 years, Cool. at least um, in, in America, I can't really speak to other countries. Mm -hmm. uh, cool. So you, uh, like, I basically think of you kind of as like the central node or like a dominant node in these networks over generations, uh, one of which is like, uh, you know, James Marcotte, like Andy Schechter, Vince, uh, you know, these people. And then now there's sort of like this new guard of like Jonathan Gagne, uh, is that how you say it? Gagne? Uh, Gagne, yeah. Gagne and um, like Chris Hendon, uh, you know, Matt mm -hmm. Perger. Uh, what do you feel like the coolest things to emerge out of both of these uh, collective intelligences are? Yeah, I mean, I mean, in the beginning, people like Andy were amazing on the the old coffee forums. You know, Andy was such a prolific poster. Like somebody, somebody I used to be friends with uh, said once, "I'm just going to read nothing but Andy's posts. I'm not going to read anything else." And mm -hmm. he has read thousands of posts by Andy because Andy was never wrong. Andy was just so clear-minded. He he has such great common sense. He still does, of course. And you know, he was such a good experimenter. Like he was a solid scientist, so that he was always testing things very methodically. And so anything that came out of his mouth, you could totally trust. Um, and Andy was always tinkering. He had, a, he had the first pressure profile machine I'd ever seen at his house and it worked great. Um, and, he, and he's a very honest guy. Like he doesn't toot his own horn. He doesn't, he's not like mm -hmm. a fanboy. He's more of like a, a skeptic who has to be won over, but he's very nice about it, you know? Um, you know, the advent of people like Chris Hendon and Jonathan Genia and Coffee is interesting because they're, they're genuine scientists by trade mm -hmm. and they're very bright guys and they're very interested in coffee, which is great because there's a lot of coffee science over the years, but not all those scientists seem to be genuine coffee enthusiasts as much as people who just happen to study coffee. Mm -hmm. Jonathan came to my roasting class about a year and a half ago in Montreal and he had emailed me ahead of time and said, I'm not a roaster, but I'd like to come to your class. Do you think it's appropriate? Normally I would say to someone, probably not, but I saw his tagline that he was an astrophysicist PhD. And I was like, I was like, you can come, you can come as my guest. Just come, and I might ask you a few science questions along the way. And so he said, okay, cool. And he came. And every time I said something that was scientifically questionable, I would turn to him and I'd be like, hey, Jonathan, was that BS or was I accurate? And he'd be like, oh yeah, that was pretty accurate. Okay, you know. And we became friends from there. And then I introduced mm -hmm. him to to Matt, and and he met James Hoffman and others. And and mm -hmm. Jonathan instantly became an integral part of our little brain trust of people who really you know want to think about the future of coffee and and you know, methodically figure out better and better ways to make coffee. Um, he's actually coming out with a book, which I'm going to help him publish this year, 
Um, awesome. It's called it's called the physics of filter coffee, um, and it's it's deep. It's awesome. Like I'm learning a ton just reading the manuscript. Um, it's been really great. So you know, having people like him and Chris and coffee is great because it legitimizes a lot of what we're doing. Some of their experiments that they performed are the things that a lot of us wish we could do, but we're just not good enough scientists to do it properly. And mm -hmm. they've taken it upon themselves to do those things. And you know, even when the results aren't what you want, or even when the experiment isn't exactly the one that you would choose, um, what they've done has been a great service to the industry because it's given us something to talk about and something to debate, and it's given us insights every time that have been really useful. Awesome, uh, yeah. cool. Uh, well, I guess in terms of like a, a decimal point, this is kind of a, a, a corny question, but in terms of a decimal point, where would you put us in terms of waves right now? Like third point? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if something really comes after third wave or third wave just morphs. Um, I, I mean, uh, your just, your video is out there. Oh, cool. sorry. Okay, somebody oh, somebody was calling. I forgot to put my phone on. Do not disturb. Sorry about that. No worries. I got a call from North Dakota. I'm guessing it's some credit card scam. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Are we going to evolve past third wave? I mean, everyone's always talking about like, what's the fourth wave? But I, I don't know. I mean, let's look at other industries, right? Like, let's look at food. Let's look at wine. Let's look at bread, uh, chocolate, tea, whatever. I feel like what third wave is in coffee is the equivalent of caring about origin, caring about processing, caring about uh, raw material quality, and then every step along the way, mm -hmm. right? And that's that's kind of what third wave is. I mean, we can be better at a lot of things, but I don't think any of those other industries have progressed much beyond that same paradigm. I think third wave is just sort of, this is where we're trying to get to, which is where the consumers and the producers of coffee care about all the different steps. Because it used to be people only cared about brewing and then they kind of only cared about roasting. And then finally, I shouldn't say only roasting, roasting and brewing. And then finally people started really caring about the green quality. And then we started really caring about how the green was processed. And then there was like a whole bunch of things sociopolitically that came along with that that people started caring about. So I feel like now we're at a point where many of us care about the entire um, uh, vertically integrated chain, chain, if you will, of like where coffee came from and how it got to us. And we're trying to be conscious of every step and, and do a good job with every step. And that's, you know, that's kind of what third wave is. And I'm not, I'm not really convinced that there's a fourth wave coming. Gotcha. Okay. Um, uh, so uh, a while ago you did yes or no by Rayo and I've been known to send you uh, very unfocused sort of shitty questions. And I think that I learned from you more so than anybody uh, how to make your questions more narrow and more effective. Uh, can you speak on uh, formulating good questions? <laughs> Well, sure. One of the things that I get, which is very challenging because I'm, I'm not the fastest typist in the world. I mean, I type maybe 50 words a minute or something, but, and it can be very frustrating to get questions that could have been phrased in a way that I could just answer with one sentence. Cause mm -hmm. you know, most of these are unsolicited questions from strangers. They're not, you know, they're not questions from clients. They're, you know, a hundred questions a week from completely random people on Instagram saying, uh, <laughs> what charge temperature should I use? And I'm like, what the fuck? I don't know. What, you know, like, I don't know yeah. what machine you have. I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what assumptions you have. Right. And I think the key to asking a good question is give exactly the amount of context that the answerer needs and then have the question lead to an answer. So I get a lot of things like, like, uh, Hey, what are your thoughts on Loring's? And I'm like, really? You just want my thoughts on Loring's as if like I have a one sentence answer? Or, or maybe people just expect that I'm going to spend 15 minutes typing an answer to total strangers on the internet and then do that all basically and quit my job because that, was, that would be all I could do with my entire week if mm -hmm. that's what I did. So I, I, people aren't getting very good perspective on that. Um, so I feel like help, help with context, but not too, too much context. Right? Like mm -hmm. give, give a paragraph. You know, your question should basically be one paragraph of, Context plus question plus leading to a relatively binary answer, that would be lovely. Like if you, mm -hmm. if you gave some context and then asked yes or no, that would be amazing. Um, because I think people want information, but they forget that, you know, I'm not a public service and James Hoffman isn't a public service and Matt Perger is not a public service. And all of us try in our own way to answer people's questions and take time out for people, but it's, it's a burden in the sense that 
you know, I was at a point once where I was spending four or five hours a week answering questions to total strangers. And that's a lot of productive time lost. You yeah, know, that's, absolutely. that's my, that's my entire weekly exercise budget time. Right. Like that's, mm -hmm. that's a lot. So, um, you know, I've tried to, I, that was one of the reasons I got more into Instagram was I figured the more information I put out there and the more I posted and the more I funneled people into public questions that the more I'd be answering people's questions ahead of time and the more people uh, would be able to read the questions and answers with other people and I'd get fewer duplicate questions. Gotcha. Yeah. Cool. Uh, so when you were, uh, I guess, like in your more developmental part of your career and you were like, like I've heard you say that you've read every written word on copy. Uh, <laughs> what type of uh, questions, like can you give some, some examples of questions that you were asking and trying to experiment to answer? Okay, so just to, to clarify, uh, I said that about reading every written word on copy when I was talking about, before I opened my first shop, I read every single book and every single magazine article I could ever find on coffee. But obviously with internet forums, that's an impossibility gotcha. now. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, it's just gone way beyond any person's ability to read it all. Um, nor do I want to read the forums, quite honestly. Um, there's too much misinformation. Um, mm -hmm. uh, formulating questions and what did I ask? Um, you know, people like James, and Andy, I would always ask them questions that were just very um, specific. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I want to know, oh, okay, so I see that you um, used a different temperature for those two coffees. I see you used a different grind setting for those two coffees, whatever. Like, like, why did you do that? Like, try to focus on something narrow because I know that the general questions of like, how do you grind for different coffees is just too unanswerable. Mm -hmm. But I know if I'm just comparing the Guatemalan and the Kenya and I'm asking questions about it, I know that it's really easy for them to say, ah, uh, you know, Guatemala breaks into more fines than Kenya does or, or vice versa. You know, that's, that's a much easier, more palatable question to deal with. Gotcha. Um, are there any, like, as we move into the future of coffee, are there any sort of like open questions that you'd like to see answered? Oh, there's, there's millions. Shit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Can you give me like two or three? Um, you know, roasting, roasting is relatively unknown in the sense that, um, you know, of the 800 or a thousand or however many chemicals there are in roasted coffee, we know very little about the reactions that are happening in the roaster. Mm -hmm. Um, we only know some benchmarks, but benchmarks are not good enough. Like that's, that's, you know, again, going back to the reductionist thing where people are just trying to put a couple of flags on a map and say that they see the whole map, but they, they really don't. Um, so I'd love to know more about what's going on in roasting. I'd love to know more about um, particle size distribution with grinding because we have this problem where everybody's model for coffee grounds involves relatively spherical particles. But coffee, hmm. coffee grinds are not spherical at all. They're these crazy, jagged, elongated, you know, meteorite-looking things. And like Jonathan's starting to work on this now. You know, he's, he's done a lot of work on particle size distribution but he also recognizes that coffee particle shapes are erratic. Um, and, you know, and it takes someone with a computer brain like his to figure this out, but you know, he's getting closer. He thinks he'll be able to model um, some combination of like brew times, fines generation, particle size distribution, uh, extraction level. Like I think he's getting closer to the point where if he were to take a particle size distribution, he, he may be able to, predict the behavior of a brew in terms of times and extraction and things like that, uh, which is fascinating because we're getting closer and closer to, you know, just like he has a, he has a handheld app. Like you can, you can put this app on your phone. You can take mm -hmm. your phone, you can take a photo of grounds and it can tell you the particle size distribution of the grounds on a white piece of paper. Yeah. yeah right? I've seen that. It's incredible. It's, it's basically a $50,000 machine for free. Mm -hmm. Right. It takes a little effort, like because you've got to take several photos and you've got to spread out the grounds properly. But if you do it right, you can get this relatively accurate answer. And he's proved that it's relatively accurate. And, you know, so we're getting closer and closer to having these super, you know, handheld data collectors and then people like him to figure out how to crunch that data and say, aha, this is what we're seeing. And, you know, I think it'll help. Like he's he's interested in bird geometry and particle size distribution, I think. All of that's been a little bit of a proprietary mystery for a long time. Like, how do you cut burrs to produce the best coffee particle size distribution? Uh, nobody really knows other than possibly like SSP and MPE and a few other companies that do these things. They have probably some theories on this. But I think someone like Jonathan might be able to crack the code and might be able to upgrade 
grinder bird geometry in a way that might make our extractions jump by a couple of percent and help us reduce fines and that kind of thing. Like, so, you know, these, these are the types of questions that interest me and, and I'm fascinated to see someone like him working on it. Cool. Cool. Uh, cool. So, uh, thinking about your ebook, uh, it's probably one of the most underrated things <laughs> in copy. Um, and when it first came out, actually, uh, you might get a kick out of this, but I sent an email to Spredge basically uh, reprimanding them for only doing articles about cat videos and not doing a feature on your thing. So then they did an article that was like, uh, Scott Rayo's new ebook is arguably more important than cat fiction. Oh, right. <laughs> uh, Thank you for that. Yeah, uh, I mean, I was just like, this is a fucking $10, uh, you know, like gold mine. So uh, since then, though, you've had like, you know, the decent espresso machine come out and there have been all these, you know, new technological uh, developments and like you know we have like super high 28 percent extractions um, can you speak about sort of like what the this you know experimentational phase has been like yeah so uh, I'll be I'll be clear that my, my goal here is to push some boundaries in order to learn my mm -hmm. goal isn't to tell you that John you need to drink 28 percent extractions it's not mm -hmm. that I don't even know if they're if they're all that much better than my 26 percent extractions or whatever but the point is this, if I can figure out how to extract 28% and if I can figure out how to extract 30%, we're gonna learn from that. And if we mm -hmm. learn from that, we may find the sweet spot somewhere that's not at the frontier, not at the edge, but until we push that boundary, we don't know what we don't know. And you know, I've learned so much by just, I decided about a year ago, I made a, I made a bet with one of my business partners. I said, let's see who can get to 25% extraction first. And he's like, you're on, right? And, and Jonathan, Jonathan was there too. And Jonathan was like, all right, I'm in, you know? And, and so we, we started working on this and, you know, my, my business partner, he got new burrs for his EK. He got his EK realigned. He, you know, he started copying some of my brewing methods. Like it's great because a little bit of competition makes everybody up their game. And was there money on the table? No, there was no money. There, there's no, there's <laughs> no chance I wasn't going to win. Come on. I was, I was definitely going to win. <laughs> okay. Um, he was he was so he was so pissed when I won. He's like, God damn it! Um, <laughs> but um, but now I'm up to the point where every day when I make coffee in the morning, my extractions are 24, 25 percent with a pour over using the decent. Mm -hmm. And and I I don't think I ever broke 22 percent until a year ago. So that's a huge change. Um, I pull espresso shots every day at 26 and a half, and if I use the paper filters uh, up top and bottom, I could probably get to 28 and a half every day. Um, not to say that every one of those extremely high extraction coffees is amazing, but most of them are very good and I'm learning by doing it. Uh, was the decent the thing that liberated you from the 22% pour over or what? It was the combination, the it was just small changes in technique and then getting the decent. Uh, the decent increases my extractions by about 1% over, over my hand pours. Interesting. Okay. Um, yeah. So, um, Changing the, the brand of filter that I'm using helps a little bit. Um, using the decent helps, I can get higher extractions with the stag than I can get with a V60. Um, you know, there's always been these little little changes that keep adding up to a couple of tenths of a percent here and there, and then boom, one day I wake up and I'm, my Kenyas are over 25%, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Cool. Um, so, Another thing, uh, back in the day, I, I think I asked you basically kind of what is your secret sauce? And your answer was something along the lines of like, oh, I've always just been obsessive. And I, I feel like I'm also obsessive, but maybe like it's not such a boon to me as it is to you. And uh, <laughs> it's like may, maybe it's like a superpower and like a super you know detriment combined to average out to like a, a slightly beneficial thing. I'm wondering mm -hmm. how you sort of regulate, tame, or like sustain your obsessiveness to be uh helpful for you i mean I, I don't find it a burden i don't find it um unhealthy um you know i think of things like i'm not nearly as smart as someone like jonathan um and i'll never be able to i mean the guy in one day the guy produces more work than i produce in a month he's 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 such a machine um but i figured you know i like to find niches right like when i got into writing about roasting no one was writing about roasting and i thought okay i'm gonna make some mistakes along the way but i want to put out the first good book about roasting and, you know, I started wondering about things like curve shape and I decided I would obsess over curve shape because that seemed to be where, where the, the benefit was. And, you know, things like that and obsessing over trying to get higher extractions. Some people will poo-poo it and be like, well, 
extraction level isn't the same as taste and they're right and wrong but the, the point is i'm learning more than i would otherwise because i'm obsessed with those couple of things mm -hmm. and so i feel like i'll never have the breadth of knowledge that jonathan has and i'll never be as productive as someone like him and i'll never be i mean matt also like matt's brain works on so many levels that mine doesn't work at but I'm just finding a couple of niches where I feel like I can push the boundaries in those niches. I feel capable of doing that. And I accept my own limitations, which is something that you'll see comes with age. You know, uh, Kurt Vonnegut said that the definition of maturity is knowing your limits. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I've become more mature because I, I recognize and accept my limits more and more. And I just think, okay, what little thing can I contribute? And I'm just trying to contribute in a couple of small ways. I'm not trying to be expert at all aspects of coffee. I'll never be an expert at green buying or tasting. Um, you know, I'm not going to enter a barista competition. There's a bunch of things I'll never do. But mm -hmm. I feel like I'm really, really focused on just a couple of things. And because of that, I can put all my energy into those things and make a difference in those small ways. Do you ever feel like you're like deficient in obsessiveness? Yeah, I obsession? mean, nah, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't even consider myself that obsessive. I, I feel like my work life and my non-work life are, are separate mm -hmm. and I don't lose sleep over coffee. I don't think about coffee too much when I'm not doing coffee or writing about coffee. So I don't know if that's really an obsession as much as I just, when I'm on the clock, I focus hard. When I'm not on the clock, mm -hmm. I don't think about it. You know? Gotcha. Yeah. I should maybe use a word with better connotations, but uh, I mean it in the best way. So. Oh, that's uh, cool. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, when it comes to work or, or knowledge, you know, obsessive is not considered a bad thing anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, I think I'm just diligent, you know, um, which is like I said, like if I'm, if I'm actually working, I just want to focus hard. And I think, I think a lot of people don't, I think a lot of people, you know, maybe they don't like their job or maybe it's not the job for them, but I think when they're, when they're working, they kind of rather be doing something else mm -hmm. and it kind of shows. And I feel like, sure, there are times where I'd rather be surfing than working, but um, if I'm going to work, I want to pour my heart into it. And then when I'm not working, I don't really care, you know? Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, so I, I guess I blew through all my questions, really, but uh, is, since we still have some time here, uh, are you able to talk about your new book? And if you want, I sure. can put this out after it comes out. But. Sure. Uh, yeah, either way. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to be too self-promotional. Um, it's called uh, Coffee Roasting Best Practices. And, you know, when I wrote my first book on roasting, it was a little bit premature in the sense that I was just getting familiar with Cropster and Artisan, and I felt like... I, I figured out the targets. I figured out that I wanted um, smoothly declining ROR curves. I figured out that uh, development time ratio mattered more than development time. And I invented the phrase development time ratio to, to kind of alert people to its, to its relevance. Um, and there were a lot of things in that book that were like, hey, here's your, here's your target. But I didn't really say in the book, hey, here's how you reach the target. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, six years later, consulting for thousands of roasters around the world, I've learned a lot. And I feel like my job is to walk up to a client and say, what's, what's your goals? They tell me their goals, and I'll give them the tools to reach their goals. And so this book is the tools. This book is, you're up against this situation, how do you solve it? You want this to, to do, you want your curve to do this, how do you do that? And so this book is very much a how-to. It's very much like a very advanced toolkit for achieving your goals as a roaster. That's it. Um, out of, I guess, of all the sort of like subsets of coffee focus, do you feel like extraction or roasting is more your expertise? Or like which do you uh, feel, I mean, obviously both, but yeah. I don't know. I mean, I, I care about both. I don't, um, you know, it's a little bit like having two kids, right? It's like, which kid do you love more? Like maybe you love <laughs> one, more, one more than the other, but you won't say. Um, <laughs> but yeah. uh, but generally you care about both of them. And I feel like the two things I focus on in coffee are uh, controlling roast curves and, and manipulating roasts and, uh, you know, maximizing coffee extraction. So those are, and I, I like having both because I think if I only did one, I'd be bored. Mm -hmm. But, but, you know, I like to play with the roasting uh, for a while. And then I'd like to go to my decent espresso machine and play with the espresso and filter for a while. And I think it keeps it a little bit more interesting. Cool. Um, I guess the last question I'll ask is uh, where, like, where would you project the sort of far future of coffee? Like, what would you project it looking like and what would you want it to look like? Look, I don't, I don't like to predict the future because it's the easiest way to look foolish. 
Mm. Um, I would just say though that um, automation is certainly mm. going to be a bigger and bigger part of coffee. Um, but beyond that, I, I, you know, I don't think much about the future of coffee in the sense that, you know, most people's future predictions are really just projections of current trends. Mm -hmm. uh, very few people are coming up with predictions that are way out there, like things no one else has ever thought of before. So I, I'm not smart enough to see the future. Um, you know, I think big picture thinkers like James are great at kind of seeing what's coming a little better than everybody else is. Um, but I'm just, I'm a tinkerer. I tinker with roasting. I tinker with extraction. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think too much about the future. Uh, it, I mean, what would you want to see ideally? Like, uh, just more focus on sort of the fundamentals, like, you know, like the sure. things you mentioned, sure. like, uh, sure. ingredient quality and all that. Sure. I mean, um, you know, we're, we're already focusing on ingredient quality and that'll only get better and better. But I think data collection integration of hardware and software like the decent espresso machine and making better use of the data whether it's roasting or brewing is it's really the key to moving forward um you know you can only rely on people's finesse so much and mm -hmm. we kind of went through that phase and it was an ugly phase of coffee where all you got was bad v60s at cafes mm -hmm. um data collection the people the thousand something people who own decent espresso machines are on a forum together it's a very nice community where we share information and share curves and things like that and recipes. And as a group, we're learning more than anybody else in the world is learning about espresso. It's, it's extraordinary. It's a very congenial group with a lot of really smart people. And we have data that no one else in the world has, and we're making use of that data. And that's to me incredibly valuable. So yeah. the same thing's happening with cropster and roasting and, you know, that to me is like the future is going to be shaped by automation and data collection. Awesome. Um, well, I'm excited to join that community eventually of decent owners <laughs> once I get a little bit more uh, cash. But sounds good. Uh, cool. Yeah, that's yeah. basically all I have to ask. Do you have anything else you want to mention where people? No. Can that was great. Thank you very much. Of course, my pleasure. Thanks for being here.